in Hornell. St. James and U of R have been tremendous partners with us uh, throughout this entire event. April 8th and 9th, the Department of Health strike team conducted universal testing at that Hornell facility. Part of the strike team then moved to the next prioritized nursing home in the Bath area. That was our number two home. Department of Health does, does, did an infection control assessment. They deemed it satisfactory and then refused to even conduct some random swabbing at that facility. Test, re, test results began to return from the Hornell area facility at that time on the 9th and the 10th, showing that a large number of staff and residents were positive, 46 in total. On April 10th, the county was not permitted to participate on a planning call with the Department of Health and the facility owner for mitigation and response planning. We learned that Department of Health will allow positive asymptomatic staff to work with COVID positive patients only. We raised our objections and concerns to this. Over the weekend of the 11th and 12th, we received hundreds of calls, emails, and social media messages about COVID positive staff being able to continue to work at the facility. We asked Department of Health for official guidance that we would be able to share with the public, which we did not receive. As, as public health has responsibility for tracking these positive individuals, it makes it difficult since we do not know exactly who remains eligible for work. On Monday the 13th, the situation at the Hornell area facility grew even more concerning. And we participated in a co coordinated call with the Department of Health and the, and the facility owner, resulting in a plan to move the COVID negative residents to an out of county facility. The county helps to coordinate transportation over the next few days for that movement. On Wednesday the 15th, we request Department of Health do universal testing at another facility in the Hornell area, and we do not get a response. So we move forward independently and coordinate with that facility to partner. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> we apologize. Let, let me uh, start that step over again for you. On Wednesday the 15th, we request Department of Health do universal testing at another facility in the Hornell area, and we do not get a response. So we move forward independently and coordinate with the facility to partner on, on the universal testing of both staff and residents. The results are back within two days and six additional residents and staff are confirmed positive. We had tremendous help from volunteer school nurses as well as St. James and U of R for this testing. Starting in the 16th, we partnered with a facility in the Bath area for universal testing of their residents and staff. This results in 16 additional positive residents and staff. Department of Health is a critical partner in our efforts and we appreciate the hard work that they have put into all of this. Everyone is stressed and stretched very thin, but with, the, but with the county being the eyes and ears on the ground, we have had to urge for a proactive response. Thank you, Darlene. And uh, yeah, we wanna stress that, uh, you know, we have coordination calls with uh, nursing homes, with hospital systems, with our state partners um, from all agencies. Um, and we value those, and, and federal agencies, um, we value those relationships, we value 
the hard work that our uh, local uh, 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 and state and federal elected officials have put into this. Um, Department of Health is, is a critical, critical partner, as Darlene mentioned. Um, so this is not uh, meant as a criticism of the Department of Health, but we want to get as much information in the public as possible. I believe that we have done this um, through the great efforts of staff here in terms of our press releases. Uh, we have tried to put out as much information proactively as possible, but we wanted to share a, a, a real detailed timeline of uh, the situation in nursing homes uh, as we speak. With the universal testing that has been done, we feel that the situation, uh, and I don't want to speak for Darlene, but we feel that the situation is much more stable than it was. Um, and a lot of that is due to the help of the New York State uh, Department of Health. Um, but it's a situation that we continue to monitor daily, um, and we uh, remain in close coordination with them. Uh, with that, we're going to open it up to uh, questions. Uh, Ken here, uh, if you can uh, raise your hand. Can you see them, Ken, to, to be able to have them raise yeah, their hand? So if, you, uh, if you're logged into the WebEx, there should be a chat button at the bottom okay. part of your screen. Okay. Be, be, before, we, before we do that, if I could, I, I believe that we have uh, uh, Senator Tom O'Mara on the line as well as Assemblywoman Marjorie Burns. Um, are, are they if, – if those – okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we, will, we will jump to questions right now. Um, so uh, please raise your hand as Ken uh, indicated, and we will uh, try to answer your questions. All right. Let's start with uh, Ariel. Okay, Ariel. W hey, hi. Thank you. Um, so we reported, our sister station also reported that um, uh, one of the Pearl Butt nursing homes in another uh, area is being, is this, the local um, government is calling for an investigation on their nursing home. I'm wondering if uh, you'll be taking similar steps towards uh, either Hornell Gardens and or other nursing homes in our area. Thank you. So uh, we can answer that. Um, so the, the issue that we that, uh, Monroe County is experiencing is different than what we have seen. Uh, from my understanding, a lot of uh, the issues that Monroe County was seeing was information, um, specifically statistics on, uh, on COVID uh, positive or negative staff, residents, and also death. Monroe felt that it wasn't uh, 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 reported um, correctly. Um, I don't know if that's we can't comment on that, not our county. Um, we, we do feel that we have very accurate data from all of our facilities here, so we are not facing that issue. And with the Department of Health's involvement uh, at all of our facilities, um, we feel that the Department of Health has already have their boots on the ground um, in our facilities and have situational awareness. So um, we are not in that position right now. We'll go to Ashley next. Okay, Ashley, next, please. Oops. You hear me? Yep, yes, gotcha. we can. Oh, can. Okay, um, when you say 24 nursing home deaths, is that uh, deaths inside nursing homes or residents who died later at a hospital? That, that is both. It is nursing home-related deaths. Okay, um, how many died, can you say, specifically inside a nursing home of the 24? We don't have that uh, specific information. That would be what is report reported to the New York State Department of Health. Uh, okay. we, we do at the local level do track whether these individuals were in a nursing home, um, then transported to a hospital, but um, that would be a question for the New York State Department of Health because they track that information. Okay, thanks. to uh, W. Wright. Who is, uh, has a right okay, W. Wright. W. Wright. Hi, can you hear me? This is Wendy Wright at Spectrum News. Yes. Hi, I wanted to, yep. can you name, you're saying the Hornell Nursing Home. Can you tell me the two that you were referring to? 
not at this time. No, we're uh, not. not at this time. No, we're we're not. Where they are. Where they are. So the two, the, the, the two impacted Cornell nursing homes are Cornell Gardens and Elderwood. Um, for specific information about case count um, at each facility, that is where the New York State Department of Health comes in. Um, and we have, uh, as Darlene has mentioned, urged them to um, proactively report uh, the data from each facility. Since we don't regulate them, um, you know, we've talked to our county attorneys and, and, and other regulating authorities. Uh, we can't release that specific information. Uh, we want to. We want to be proactive, but that would be a question for the New York State Department of Health. Question for the New York State Department of Health. So the 24 deaths, either in or at hospitals, um, for these residents were either at uh, Hornell Gardens or Elderwood. There aren't any deaths from other nursing homes in your county? There, there is, there, uh, there is uh, one other nursing home. There was a cluster of three nursing homes who, uh, there were three nursing homes, excuse me, who had clusters. And as Jack mentioned, two of them were Hornell Gardens and Elderwood in the Hornell area. And in Bath, it was the Harriet and uh, Taylor Nursing Center. And then, um, you know, the, it's, are they, are, let me clarify the positive employees who were working there. That, um, I can see why that might throw some um, residents' families off a little bit. So are they no longer working with these patients, or do you still have COVID-positive uh, employees working with the COVID-positive patients or residents? Well, you know, that's a well, facility you know, that's decision. A facility decision. Um, they, uh, uh, to our knowledge, there, there are still um, some that are working there, but, I, but the facility Schedule the, they, they, they schedule their staff based on, based on their needs, um, it, but that is why we objected from the beginning to that, to that scenario, uh, it, having asymptomatic positive staff working in the nursing home uh, really didn't meet the definition of isolation of those individuals, so that's why um, we were very concerned about that. And, and, about that. and, 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 and uh, is, a, is a question for uh, the New York State Department of Health, and we understand why. Uh, I'm not a medical professional. I understand why there needs to be flexibility for emergent situations where staffing levels be some, become so critical that you need to find a different way to respond. So this is this is not to cast judgment, but we feel that it's important. It's, it's in the public interest to know that that can uh, uh, occur. Um, under New York State uh, uh, Department of Health uh, guidelines. So in terms of uh, who, is, who is currently working uh, there, uh, again, that would be a New York State uh, Department of Health question. Health question. And one more thing, I know there's a bunch of people waiting, but you moved out, uh, you said COVID positive or patients who were not COVID positive? The, the facility selected um, which patients they would choose. They chose COVID negative um, for that reason, so that positives weren't being, you know, transported to another facility and then wind up with with a new cluster in a new facility. A new facility. Okay. Next question will be from Tommy Sladek uh, out of Syracuse. Just a reminder, folks, uh, when you are asking your question, once you're done asking your question, please make sure your phones are muted. There's a number of people that have headsets on and have uh, headsets phones. on and. Okay, Tommy from Syracuse. Thanks for making the time this afternoon. You guys really appreciate it. Um, with the governor just yesterday uh, talking about the mandate where these nursing homes, if they have positive cases or um, confirmed deaths related to COVID-19, that they have 24 hours to give that information to the Department of Health. Why is it so important that the nursing homes in Steubing County follow that? Well, I think it's important that any, any nursing home follow that. It, you know, as everyone knows, families uh, cannot, uh, haven't been able to visit their loved ones in nursing homes for over a month. So there's no way for them to, to check on them, to know exactly, you know, even uh, what their uh, 
physical condition is. I mean, I'm, I'm certain they're calling in and getting a report from facility staff, but they aren't able to lay eyes on them and visit with them and see them and know exactly what's going on with them, as I'm sure that they would like to. So, um, you know, certainly having, knowing <laughs> within, uh, within 24 hours that, that something has happened to your loved one is vitally important for these families that, that cannot get into the facilities at this time. And this will also be affecting not only the, the residents that do turn up positive, but also the family members of everyone related to those nursing homes. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, because there's, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, residents in the nursing homes who are negative. They have not, they don't have symptoms and haven't tested positive for COVID. But, uh, you know, you can imagine the, the worry of family knowing that they're, even if they know their, their loved one is negative, but they also know they're in a facility where there's, where there's positive residents and, and, the, and the possibility of uh, transmission of the virus. Uh, last but not least, um, it- this is communication that is also important for county officials like yourselves to then be quickly working, maybe with the Department of Health of Nebe. That that is correct. And I, uh, one thing that we started from really day one when we opened up the emergency operations center back on March. 14th, I believe, uh, from day one, we initiated and we facilitate a daily, seven days a week, a daily phone call, conference call with, um, between ourselves here at the Emergency Operations Center and all of our local hospitals and all of our local nursing homes. We all come together every day at the same time. They issue us uh, situation reports every morning that list, um, that list the data related to their COVID patients. And um, so we review that. We review um, any issues they have. We review their PPE needs in each facility. It's been a, a, a very productive, efficient use of everyone's time. And, and again, uh, like, like Darlene mentioned, uh, the facilities uh, have been fantastic to work with. Uh, they don't, there's, they're under no regulation to provide that information to us, both hospitals and nursing homes. We don't regulate them, but because of what we're all dealing with collectively, they've all stepped up, been willing to share the information on both, you know, the COVID situation in their facilities and also PPE, which the the county helps uh, coordinate once we get pushes from the state. We know that's an issue. We wish we had more, but that daily communication really helps. And it provides us with a situational awareness so that when Darlene has to call the New York State Department of Health or our state officials, federal officials for assistance, we know exactly what's happening on the ground. And that's why, you know, again, we value the partnership with the New York State Department of Health. Um, in a lot of ways, like Darling said, we're the eyes and the ears on the, on the ground, even though, you know, there's, there's a separation, you know, we're not the same government, but we're all working together. And I know they're working tremendously hard. So again, not a criticism towards them. This, this is just getting information to the public because we feel it's important. Um, you want to go to the senator and something? do you have them? Uh, I'm not able to specifically identify, so I will unmute and see if we can. Okay. Okay. So we're going to try to unmute um, uh, to try to get uh, Senator Tom O'Mara and Assemblywoman Marjorie Burns um, to provide a, a couple comments if they would like. Kenny's trying it right now. Senator, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we got you. Okay. Great. Well, uh, uh, Jack, thank you for putting this together. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the lead on this and uh, the job that you've done uh, in Staben County uh, with the county health department. Uh, you guys have been doing fantastic work. I know myself, uh, and Assemblywoman Burns, Assemblyman Palmasano, Congressman Reed have been on many calls with all of you, uh, with people from the Department of Health, and appreciate the strong attention that you're paying uh, to these very, very difficult uh, situations. Uh, I know it's been frustrating. Uh, getting uh, reactions at times from uh, the State Department of Health or from the governor's office to get certain things done. Um, You know, we're here to work with you. Uh, We share that frustration, uh, and we'll continue to work uh, with you uh, to get things moving. You know, there appears to be uh, uh, decent attention being paid now, uh, not just to Stephen County, but uh, across the state. We certainly know that our nursing homes have been hotbeds 
uh, across the state. Uh, it's, it's certainly the situation in, in Hornell uh, has been one of those. Uh, but uh, uh, your leadership is very much appreciated with your, uh, uh, your local uh, connections, your boots on the ground, uh, so to speak, in helping get uh, and coordinating the testing that's been done uh, in all these facilities uh, and, and working to make sure that uh, at least that initial plan uh, to move those patients out of Hornell Gardens uh, was concluded. Thank you very much, Senator. And we uh, very much appreciate your support in, in uh, escalating all these issues and, and advocating for us. So thank you very much. Assemblywoman Burns, do you have any comments for us? Just very briefly, Jack, I can't thank you and all the Steuben County officials. And uh, I know Mayor Buckley can't be with us right now, but uh, he's been a phenomenal uh, resource and uh, advocate for his community. Uh, and your Department of Health has been fantastic with keeping me informed, and, uh, and I'm very grateful for all of your efforts. I still remain very concerned about what's happening at uh, the Hornell nursing facilities, all of the nursing facilities, but those in my district. And I know there was a question earlier uh, with reference to the Brighton facility in Monroe County, but I also have ongoing concerns about a situation in Avon as well. So I will continue to stay very invested with making sure that uh, all of our seniors are taken care of uh, to the best of our ability with the medical uh, facilities and staffs that are available. The staffs have been doing a phenomenal job. Yes, thank absolutely. And, and thank you, Assemblywoman, for all of your tremendous support. And you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, Mayor Buckley, unfortunately, couldn't be with us, but he has been tremendous. Uh, you know, uh, he cares uh, just like we all do about the local community, and, and he, he lives a stone's throw away from Hornell Gardens uh, and, and from Elderwood, so uh, he knows uh, certainly the local impact. So thank you very much. Uh, more questions from the press, uh, Kenny? Uh, Griffin Haas has a question. Griffin, W-E-N-Y. Yes, thank you very much for, for taking the time and talking with us today. Um, so about two weeks back, uh, you know, our station received a couple of complaints uh, from Cornell Gardens employees regarding uh, a lack of PPE and also being told that they need to share PPE. Um, I'm wondering if you have heard similar complaints to that from Cornell Gardens, if that was investigated, and if that might still be an ongoing problem. So, uh, uh, and, and Darlene can certainly uh, speak to it. Um, you know, we have heard uh, what you have heard through social media and other things. I can say that on our daily coordination calls, uh, we monitor what's called burn rate. Um, our Office of Emergency Management, um, uh, Tim Marshall, Ken Friends do a phenomenal job, Matthew Marmor from Public Health. They monitor how much PPE each facility uses. And at times, uh, PPE became a pretty serious concern, especially at the Hornell area facilities. Um, can't speak to their internal infection control practices because, again, we don't regulate them. Um, we haven't sent, sensed this because we don't regulate them and, and uh, we don't have the ability to step foot in their facilities. I, I can't speak to specifically what happened. I, I, I were aware of, of, uh, of the, the reports, uh, certainly. Um, but can't speak to, uh, you know, uh, the, the accuracy of them or, uh, or what's happened. But I do know that we have sent uh, now four separate distributions from the state. We receive uh, from the state stockpile, which then goes, uh, uh, gets distributed uh, by us here at the EOC um, to the area facilities in a special focus has been put on the three facilities that we're talking about. So they have received uh, larger numbers of supplies uh, than the other facilities. Thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Daniel North. From Daniel North, Spectrum. Okay, uh, it looks like Daniel's question is, uh, it feels like during this time the public is learning that nursing homes are private and overseen by the state. Do you believe the oversight of the nursing homes will or should change in the future? I, uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't 
foresee the um, regulatory oversight of nursing homes changing from State Department of Health. Um, it, that's how it, um, to my knowledge, always been, and I, I don't, um, I don't foresee as a result of this that it that it will change. You know, it's it. This is um, uncharted territory for all of us, and um, I, the you know the likes of which we haven't seen before, and hopefully we never will again. And it put just as much stress on the State Department of Health system as it did our, our local public health system here and on the, the nursing homes themselves and the Office of Emergency Management for trying to provide a, you know, enough PPE through the, through the state stockpile. It's, it's been a Herculean effort from everyone and, and I, you know, I, think, I think we've um, probably you know, all, all made some missteps along the way, but, but hopefully um, I know just speaking for public health and Office of Emergency Management in the county, uh, we have we have made every attempt possible to be uh, responsive and and do the right thing and and communicate uh, to the the community in ways that probably we haven't before. Uh, we've really been intentional in in getting the message out in terms of everything everything COVID related and, and try to educate uh, the public. And, and uh, Laura Lee Wagner here, uh, the, the public health uh, education coordinator has been doing a phenomenal job. I think most of you uh, in the press and we certainly see it by our page likes and follows on Facebook and other social media. Um, you know, proactive communication as Darlene mentioned really is, is the key. Um, we wanna share as much information as humanly possible because the more informed people are, you know, it, 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 number one, educates them, it stops the fear, but it also provides them with the tools that they need to know what's happening in our relatively small community. Okay, our next question is from uh, George Stockberger with WETM. George WETM. Hi, Jack and Darlene. Thank you again for doing this. Um, do you know the active number of cases uh, in Stubank County? Um, how many are active in the nursing home and what percentage of cases uh, that the county has had are from nursing homes? We, we do have the active in nursing homes. We, yes, we do have uh, uh, 48 uh, individuals in nursing homes right now across the county that are, have tested positive for COVID. Those are active cases? Yes. Yeah. Those are the actives, correct, in nursing homes. Okay. Um, has anyone that got transferred to the Waterloo facility tested positive? There's, yes, there, there's been um, three, I believe. Okay, were they removed from the, from the facility? What was kind of a protocol for them? Our, our understanding is, it, uh, again, that's where the State Department of Health uh, works with the, w works with the, the facility. Um, they worked on a transfer. Our understanding, uh, because we talked to the facility, is that those individuals were transported back to the original facility in Hornell. Okay. And we, we focused on three different nursing homes. Are there any other nursing homes that have had cases in Steuben County, or is it mainly those uh, three that we've mentioned? It's been those three that we've mentioned. Okay, and, so there's and Darlene. Right, there's there's Darlene, Darlene and her in Hornell with that. Sorry. No, no, go ahead, George. There's been no other cases in any nursing homes in Steuben County ever in those three facilities. That, that's correct. Correct. And, and knock on wood, we won't have one, but um, the, the approach that Darlene uh, and her staff has taken in, in consultation and really at the, the suggestion of the, department, the New York State Department of Health at the beginning, we thought it was a brilliant suggestion about uh, universal swabbing of both staff and residents so you can actively identify, isolate, and mitigate. Um, we have to give them a ton of kudos because we saw what happened at the first facility and how, we, uh, and how uh, through partnership with the facility, they were able to isolate, mitigate, and try, try to control the situation. Should we have, and hopefully it doesn't happen, but should we have another facility I mean, I don't want to speak for Darlene, but our internal conversations are we would take the same approach. It's not singling out facilities. Um, and I think if you talk to other counties, if you, I, I know our counterparts in Livingston, uh, Assemblywoman Burns mentioned it. Um, I know she's working very hard with Livingston County to take the same approach uh, at one of their facilities. 
Um, it's a model that, you know, hopefully uh, it sounds like the state is rolling out um, because that's really the only way that you know how, how widespread the problem is in any particular facility. I know, you know, the common uh, uh, perspective and philosophy is to assume that everyone has it. And then I think that's why sometimes either either no swabbing is done or um, or random swabbing, but uh, but honestly, when it comes to the capacity and ability to st adequately staff a nursing home, um, I just think it's um, it's crucial to know who has it and who and who doesn't, uh, because they they have a, a you know certainly a threshold of of staff that they need to adequately take care of the residents, and so if everyone is swabbed. And we'll know exactly who, who it is, both staff and residents. And then the goal is for those positive individuals to be, co you know, the residents cohorted and, and the, the staff hopefully not working um, and, and certainly not working if, if they have symptoms. And, and as we know, symptoms have presented differently um, across the board. Okay. I, I just want to double check. I don't know if they're considered a nursing facility, but have there been any cases at the Bath VA? Um, I, not that we know of. We're on the phone with them daily. I know that they have done testing. They are actually uh, conducting uh, testing, uh, uh, you know, almost on a daily basis up there serving the veterans, but we have not been made aware of that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Our um, last question that we have in the chat is from uh, Wendy Wright. Okay, Wendy Wright, uh, that's the okay, Wendy Wright, uh, that's the question. Yes, hi, thank you for taking another question. I just want to be clear on what you're asking the state to do. More testing, what, and if that's the case, what else do you want the state to, to step in and help with, specifically? Well, uh, currently, well, I, uh, we aren't asking for anything specific from the state. Um, as Jack mentioned, if one of our other uh, facilities or nursing homes in the area, if we begin to see a cluster in there, that would be my request, um, would, would be to um, repeat this, asking them to come down and do an infection control assessment, as well as the universal uh, swabbing of residents and staff. But, but currently, I, I, there is not a request into them that's outstanding at this point in time. And, and the, other, the other thing, and, and we've made the request before, but um, the guidance on allowing positive asymptomatic staff to continue to work with positive residents, again, not a medical person, that, that might be a, a, a very, uh, very viable um, option. But the locals, we are the ones who end up getting the questions that we can't answer from family, families of residents, from staff themselves. Uh, Personal opinion, I think the state needs to put out guidance that the public knows about, about if they are going to make exceptions in nursing homes to let positive asymptomatic staff continue to work. I think the public needs to know that. Needs to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our final question goes. Our final question goes. Ariel, final question. Stand by. Yes, touch it. <laughs> um, oh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, earlier you mentioned that you had four separate distribution orders of PPEs from from the state stockpile, um, and you also say that you're communicating on a daily with these facilities about PPEs. Have um, nursing homes uh, been saying that they need more? Have they been voicing that? Because that's what we're hearing. Yeah, it, it has happened. Um, everyone can use more. Um, they, many are in, from what we understand, and again, we're not in those facilities, we're just repeating also what we hear, that, uh, and CDC and Department of Health has released guidance about con uh, conserving. Um, you know, before there wouldn't be reuse of N95 masks. Now they're, now they're potentially, you know, wearing them in an entire shift um, or maybe multiple days. There, there is conservation happening. Um, we do need more PPE upstate so that we can distribute it to the facilities, but we haven't heard, uh, again, um, through the reports that we get that any of the facilities got down to a supply of zero on anything. And, and every day as part of those uh, phone calls with the facilities, 
uh, the Office of Emergency Management asked them, they say, what are your top three PPE needs? So each facility has opportunity on a daily basis to tell us that. And we, uh, the, the OEM has done a fantastic job in, in uh, just scouring <laughs> the, the universe almost to be able to um, fill those PPE needs if they can't get them um, you know, from the state stockpile. But it's, it's a daily conversation and a daily prioritization. Uh, um, uh, of those PPE needs with the facilities. And, and we have even, to Darlene's point, um, you know, uh, we, we don't have a nursing home any longer. Uh, Darlene, uh, we, we have a, a, not a full, uh, full service public health department. Um, uh, they do awesome work, but we don't have a public health department the size of Monroe County. So we're not ordering medical supplies in large quantities hardly any other time uh, other than uh, the things that public health needs to do, but we have worked, uh, uh, her staff purchasing and others have worked to uh, use uh, uh, county tax dollars um, to purchase N95 masks, to purchase gowns. Um, the community has done an awesome job stepping up. Uh, we've had so many sewing groups uh, sewing reusable gowns uh, and bringing them uh, to our stockpile for distribution. So. It's all hands on deck. Our legislature has been fantastic under Chairman Van Etten in, you know, being flexible and, and, you know, money's tight. This is going to be a bad budget time, but we need to step up also to try to procure that, uh, that equipment. But, um, and not to derail too much, but we're all fighting for the same thing. Stuben County is looking for this while Shimon County is looking for it, while the state is looking for it and the feds are looking for it. So we're all trying to tap these very limited supply chains at the same time. And, the purchasing power of Steuben County in comparison to the state and then to the nation is pretty small. So it's been a challenge, but uh, it's something that we've uh, actively worked on. All right, uh, looks like that's it. Thank you so much. Um, we, uh, you know, any follow-ups, please let us know. We plan on continuing our weekly uh, calls, uh, maybe through this format, maybe just uh, phone, but um, we will stay in touch and everyone be safe. Thank you.